Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. On this episode of the podcast, Craig Jeffrey sits down with Seth Marlowe, Senior Director and Head of Treasury Strategy of Synovus, to discuss the concept of continual redesign as a mindset with view to banking and treasury. Topics of discussion center around digitalization of receivables and payments, the future of banking, new technology solutions, and more. Listen into the discussion for valuable insights into the banking world. Welcome back to the podcast, Seth. Thanks, Craig. Great to be with you again. I I love this topic that we're going to cover, and and you and I have had conversations over many, many years. uh, You know, so this idea of continual redesign as a mindset as part of banking and treasury is exciting. Um, While a lot of people know you, and before we get to the core topic, I I think uh, it would be useful to take a quick tour of your career so everybody knows where you've been and, and where you're coming from. So maybe you could Give us a quick summary of your career journey, uh, just hitting on the highlights. Sure, I'll, I'll try to keep that brief because there have been a bunch of stops along the way. Actually started at, at EY back long before it was EY uh, in management consulting on the technology side. And uh, about three years of that, and uh, then got into uh, a corporate role for the first time at PepsiCo. And that's where I actually eventually wound my way from IT into a treasury role, running treasury operations at Pepsi, uh, which was a ton of fun. And actually one of one of the you know greatest world class companies I've, I've I've had the pleasure to work for. Was aching to get back to IT. Went to Praxair. Had a short stop there. Um, realized uh, the error of my ways and went back to treasury in a treasurer's role. Um, interestingly, um, for the uh, U.S. and Canadian businesses of Group Danone in the water division. So basically, for those people who might remember Dan and Water, and we, we called it a project. Well, it was a project and it, it is no more, but it was also the Evian import business. So I was the, the treasurer of the water group um, in North America for a couple of years. From there, I went to GE Capital and was part of what I consider to this day the, the greatest treasury organization on the planet, a place where you can get very deep in just about any area of, of corporate treasury, whether it's payments, treasury management systems, intercompany activity, everything that was done there was, was, was scaled to massive uh, lengths. Frankly, with all the um, TMS and SWIFT work we were doing, we were the poster children for uh, SWIFT for corporates back in the day. Um, I really kind of bit the bug on, on payments and banking and decided my next role was going to be in banking. And um, I, I made the move to Wells Fargo uh, initially to work on the integration of uh, Wells and Wachovia after that giant uh, uh, merger. And uh, from there, had a number of different roles, both in the uh, treasury product management and treasury sales organizations, back and forth a few times. Um, in my, my last role there, I was in a, uh, a treasury advisory group that was working uh, with our top tier customers, with CFOs, treasurers, really guiding them on what the journeys could be in and around treasury and emerging technology. And it was a ton of fun. And um, unfortunately, uh, we, we parted ways um, in 2020, and um, I landed at this great southeastern bank called Synovus, um, which probably wouldn't have been on my radar screen if it weren't for COVID, because what, what, what's a northerner like me supposed to do in a southeast bank? So, um, but lo and behold, working remotely works, and uh, they brought me on board um, Thrilled to be there, and uh, our, our head of TM, Catherine Weislogel, talks about the wild ride, and it's about a lot of the transformation and continuous change that we're going through. So it's it's uh, thematically it's it, it's perfect, and it is a wild ride, but having a blast. Yeah, a lot of activity there. Now you also have some, I don't want to call them extracurricular activities, but they're um, you you use a moniker, the Treasury Whisperer. Do you want to? 
tell uh, tell the audience a little bit about that? Yeah. So you know, interesting story. Having having moved over to the the banking side, you know, as I started doing more and more uh, customer calling, especially with the larger middle market customers and um, you know wholesale and, and and large corporate customers. What, what I found more and more is that when I would be talking to them along with a treasury sales officer and a relationship manager, um, all eyes tended to turn to me. It's not because I'm anything special, but I do have a secret sauce and it's that I've been a treasurer and I've, I've been a practitioner. So I've walked in their shoes and I would hear things and recant stories and my understanding of, of their day to day and their pain points, it resonated with them. They, they, they saw someone that was more like them, not like your you know, traditional banker. And so, you know, uh, I've been a big fan of LinkedIn for many, many years. I consider myself a big networker. You know, frankly, I had, I had had as a description in the back end of my, uh, my, my, my profile that just described me as a treasury whisperer. I, I thought it was kind of interesting and apropos. Uh, um, until about three years ago, I was being introduced on a webinar by a regional AFP chapter. It was actually Philadelphia. And uh, I was literally introduced that day uh, in the moment as the Treasury Whisperer. And I, I sat there dumbstruck in the very same seat I'm sitting in now, thinking, wow, I know I have built a personal brand, but now I have a brand name. I can actually use that. It had never occurred to me to use that as anything other than a, a, as a descriptor. And it's stuck and I've created a logo and, you know, I, I have fun with it. It, it. It's a good time. And, you know, it, 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 it certainly helped, you know, um, uplift my profile a little bit in, in the industry. But um, I, I think I, I think the, the, the my my regular name <laughs> is, you know, uh, I wouldn't say a household word, but a lot of people in the industry do know me um, on both the banking and, and treasury sides. Sure, sure. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, the background on, on on your career and some of the history. And it's been good to know you for quite a long time. And I know we've spoken many times, not just on this podcast, but uh, conferences and different events. Um, I want to move to this, uh, the the main theme in terms of the redesign mindset, you know, this idea of continual redesign as a mindset. Um, you know, when we think about that, um, you know, we think about continual redesign doesn't see process changes or transformation as there's a single endpoint, uh, but rather as a mindset, a continual mindset, you know, to get there requires some building up to that. And, you know, given your background, as you described, you know, corporate on the treasury side and also on the banking background, with uh, you know the tech uh, tech side as well as technical aspects of of treasury, how do you view the new environment around the cash conversion cycle? So core treasury, the conversion of cash through um, you know receivables, payables, inventory, et cetera. You know, so when we think about the cash conversion cycle and banking fintech services, how how do these fit together? Maybe you can talk about the mindset. Well, you know, I, I think the mindset, and, and, and for me, I think it goes back to my, um, you know, uh, early, early in my career, really as, a, as an IT guy. And you look at the projects that you wanted to do, and everything was big. And you talked about, you know, two year projects, and nothing's live until you get to the end of the two years. At the same time, um, you know, there, we've, we've gone from this uh, waterfall approach to agile and that's become all the rage and now we see that happening with devops and um you know what what i think it's led to is it is an understanding not just from an it perspective not just from a project management perspective but from management in general that the best way to look at anything is in small manageable chunks and i think if you apply those rules to the cash conversion cycle it's the same thing i mean you don't you don't seek out to fix the entire cash conversion cycle in one fell swoop. You may look at what are the improvements you need to make on, on the payment side and make some changes to improve or, or change the dynamics around your DPO. You know, you look at the receivable side and what are your pain points there and how do you solve for that and bring down your DSO. Um, same thing with any kinds of inventory ch uh, churn and changes. A lot harder to affect that kind of change, usually from a treasury perspective. 
But the bottom line is you can't do it all simultaneously. I mean, you, you could certainly have disparate teams that are working on pieces of it, depending on the size of your organization and the capacity you have. But the, the, the secret in all of this is realizing that it's important, number one, to get started. And number two, to go through a process where you take on something that's small enough that it's both manageable to achieve and to be successful, and at the same time can have some degree of impact. And the importance in, in that first one is getting it under your belt, proving to yourself, your teammates, your organization, people above you, um, and depending on wh what the impacts are, potentially it's your vendors, it could be your customers, it's proving that you can do it. And, and creating that track record of success. And then it's building on that. And so the next one may be another chunk that's a little bit bigger. And you kind of, I like to say, you rinse and repeat and you do it again. And, and I think as we see with Agile, it's, it's all of these sprints and you just, you keep sprinting. And, and I, I think that's something that we, we all have to develop that, that muscle memory of what it's like to sprint because the sprints sometimes get more challenging. You know, you may go from a sprint that's on flat, flat ground um, to having a sprint a little more uphill in, 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 in the subsequent uh, ones that you're doing. And I, I think a lot of this, it gets you into the cycle, but it, it, it builds over time, just like muscle memory. It builds that, that, that mindset of continually looking for what's next. And what's next? And it's funny. I've I've had um, that 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 term resonated with me. So during during um, uh, I guess last year during COVID, my wife and I decided actually before the election we decided to binge watch um, um, the West Wing. And so probably the the one thing that so resonated with me was uh, you know hearing about you know what's next. And I think you always have to have your eye on what are the next things that you wanna do because you do need to plan for this. You do need to lay the groundwork in your earlier sprints and the earlier successes you have for the things that you wanna build on top of that. And it's that much easier if you have, you know, the vision and foresight of where you wanna to go to be able to keep building on, on top and on top and building it out, broadening the scope. Um, and, and so, it, you know, all together that becomes really, I think the overall, uh, you know, change and continuous change mindset. I like that. So, uh, so what's next and building your, uh, having a, developing a reputation and building on it. Those are, those are some, uh, some good points there, Seth. Now I want to talk or hear you talk on receivables and payables. I think expanding from this view of the new environment of, um, agile versus this waterfall, you know, gradual and continual improvements. I want to talk about digitization. Um, you know, companies certainly have been moving more towards digital from, from paper processes or separated processes, interrupted processes over to more electronic, more handoffs. Um, this has a straight through processing element, digital to digital. And there's also a speed component to what's going on. How do we do things faster? How do we do things more digitally? Reduce the number of defects. So um, what are you thinking about and seeing in terms of the broader processes for receivables and payables, you know, part of the cash conversion cycle? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's a great question. And I, I, I think um, COVID was a, a crisis that I think made a lot of organizations, a lot of CFOs and treasurers, you know, not only in corporations, but I think in, 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 the, in the financial services world as well, stand up and realize that this is a crisis that needs a response that includes the action to further digitize. And, and so, you know, what, what I've certainly seen over the last 12 months or so is this, this urge to speed up a lot of the projects to uh, get to digital, paperless, contactless, and to try to do it in a hurry because all of a sudden people, were, people weren't going to offices. People couldn't touch the paper. Although you, you hear anecdotes of people, yeah, they were still in the office. They would go in for an hour to you know, print the checks or pick up the checks. But I think it, it, it really pushed a, a digital mindset on everybody that it has to be first, first and foremost 
because this is the environment we're going to be in. And I, I think a lot of us, as we got into it, you know, started to realize that none of us knew how long it was going to go. Plenty of people could have, you know, looked into their crystal ball and projected out. Um, certainly the Treasury Coalition, I think the work that you spearheaded, Craig, was, was great on, on getting people to think about where, where we were collectively in, in the crisis. It, it forced people to say, look, I don't know what the new reality is going to look like. But what I do know is I need efficiency. I need digitization. And, you know, this was no surprise to anybody. We've been talking about this stuff. I, mean, I was talking about paper electronic, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago. And, and it goes way, way before that. So I think this was that, that historical moment where people went from, yeah, I know I need to do it to now I have to do it. It's, a, it's much more about survival and go forward and not knowing what the ultimate future looks like. And, and, and I think what we're going to see, frankly, is there are companies that are not going to go back to offices. A lot of the tech companies have, you know, have said they're not going anywhere back to an office until 2022. Um, I, I, you know, there's, uh, you know, some concerns in, in, you know, in the real estate markets that, you know, you know, a company is going to reduce footprints. Maybe yes, maybe no. They may use the same size of space for a lot less people, and it's going to be more, more than likely a lot more hoteling. But work from home and work from anywhere, um, I, I, I think, are very much here to stay. And I, I look at my own situation. I don't know that without COVID that I would have been a viable option for a Southeast Georgia-based bank when I continue to live and, 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 and work in, in the Northeast in Connecticut. Um, but a lot of companies have done that. And they've said, you know, this is an opportunity for bringing in top talent in the organization that I may not have locally. Or, or this may be a best choice, you know, if I have a broader geographic range to look at. Um, so, it, you know, it, it all comes back to, you know, having to, to, to leverage those digital tools and, and to, to, to simplify everything that we do and realizing that we can't, we can't touch all this paper anymore. This new digital mindset, um, you know, continual, agile, um, and remote, I guess, is uh, not bound by paper and not bound by geography. Um, yeah, really good points. Seth, uh, you know, in terms, of, um, in terms of our discussion, I wanted to look at the future of corporate banking. There's a lot of discussion on the future of retail banking, um, but I wanted to extend the discussion and maybe even get into some tangents. I wanted to look at two areas, payments and technology, but I'd like you to th talk uh, through your thinking on what, what will the future look like? And I'm not looking for just six months down the road, that's too short, and I don't wanna hear uh, you know, 60 years or 100 years in the future, you know, something that's like, that's reasonably aggressive and, um, and helpful, I think, to position our thinking. And I know you do a lot on this, so we'd love to hear you. Maybe you could start with payments, then we'll move to, to tech, and I'll, I'll ask you a couple specific questions there on the tech side. But if you start with payments, that'd be great. You know, I think the first thing to say, just like they say that, uh, you know, 50 is the new 40 and 40 is the new 30, looking into the future, I, I, you know, looking, you know, five years ahead, you know, um, or, or 10 years ahead, you know, years ago, 25 years ago, look, looking, you know, 10 years ahead, um, you know, you know, sort of in, 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 you know, you could probably get some of it right. I, I don't think you can even look 10 years ahead. I, I, I think looking at three to five is probably at most. But there, there, there's, there's so much changing and it's such an exciting time in and around payments. I, I think the fact that, you know, the, the realities of real-time payments, I mean, they're here. And whether it's uh, RTP, whether it's pushing payments through the card rails, and, and getting money directly into bank accounts, whether it's uh, some of the well-established fintechs like, like PayPal, um, you know, in even the, the, the less new, but the, the more, I'll call it bank-endorsed products like Zelle. I mean, money moves in instance today. So, you know, you combine all of that, and I was really excited to see this, um, I guess it was in, in, in the past week, Notch announcing that, 
the, the limit on same day ACH is going to move up to a million dollars in 2022. That to me is a game changing event, um, probably being precipitated by more volume and more activity happening in RTP, uh, the future Fed now, um, all of that driving it. Nothing like a little competition here. You know, the movement away from, you know, the Fed wire, which, you know, in theory, you know, moves, you know, at least bank to bank uh, in, in seconds. But until it actually gets into uh, a recipient's bank account, a whole nother story. And, you know, you still have you still have lawyers calling in for Fed reference numbers on on deal closings. You got to love it. Um, but I, so I, I think speed is really, really critical and, and tied into that is the whole experience. Now, there are some things with that payment experience that people of a certain age are more comfortable with than others. Um, I find it kind of cringeworthy when I'm doing a, a Venmo payment and, um, you know, I, I can put an emoticon or an emoji um, and some text that others can possibly see. Mine are all private. I, I can't, I just, I'm not sharing that. Uh, it's bad enough that you might see that I, I've made a payment. It, it's, uh, that's between me and the, and the recipient. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, other, other generations take, find value in that. And I, I think as we look at the model of RTP and Fed now, of it being much more of a message-based payment. So yes, the payment itself is a real-time or an instant payment, but there's more that goes along with it. it it's, there could be a pre-message, it's a request for a payment, it's a request for information. All those other pieces are part of what's really become part of our uh, I think our social media mindset of put stuff out there, get a response. You know, it's it, it's this you know uh, back and forth that goes on, and um, so I I think one of the things that we're going to see over a time horizon is not not just the adoption of of those uh, payment channels for the the payments and the the speed and efficiencies, but the other pieces of the messaging that go along with it. You know, I, I think typically if you look at um, any of, of, of the tools, the apps, the trends that happen, it all happens on the consumer side first. And I won't say that corporates are fast followers. They're not. They're, there's a lag and it's, it's usually multiple year lag. But I, I, I think that there will become a time and a place um, in the not too distant future where those additional messages that are part of the payment uh, process stream will become very reg a very regular part of the equation. And you know, it might lead to you know, apps that are really corporate focused that are really about the messaging before and after. Um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, but there is, there is a huge shift in what's gonna have to happen in the entire ecosystem. You know, how, you know, ERP systems ingest this information, how banks ingest it and then distribute it back out. But that's all happening at the same time that we've got more and more efforts in and around open banking and API connectivity. So at, at some point, and we're seeing this already with, you know, banking as a service, you know, banks are becoming um, commonplace as something inside another institution. It was interesting to see recently, for example, Walgreens, a drug retailer, as well as H&R Block, a tax prep company, um, are, are, are looking at uh, being able to uh, kind of have banking. And, and, and that's going to be embedded services, embedded finance uh, within the greater enterprise. And they've already got these huge customer bases. So I, I think what we're going to see is a lot of new players that are gonna find their way into either banking or payments or both, but on the surface may not actually be banks. And, and we, we see some of that today, but I think it's gonna become very commonplace so that not only are you gonna have, you know, even as a consumer, an app that allows you to buy coffee, uh, hail a cab. Does anybody hail a cab anymore? Um, no, we, we, all, we all call an Uber. But I, I mean, I think the point being that you know, even a Starbucks, I mean, you could really consider Starbucks a bank. They don't have a bank charter, but you know, if you think about 
um, the amount of money that's on all of their Starbucks rewards cards, both the plastic as well as what's simply a card on, on a phone app, um, you know, they, they've got a, a huge deposit base. You know, so what's what's to stop that from being replicated over and over and over again by, you know, any number of big name retailers, um, other kinds of enterprises that already have huge customer bases. And let's face it, some some more some organizations, some companies have been trying to go down this path to offer financial services in one way, shape or form for years. I mean, Walmart has made multiple attempts at this. Uh, Walmart was the center of. Uh, uh, you know, uh, of, of the many retailers that were looking to stand up MCX about five to eight years ago, um, which was going to be a competing card network uh, kind of built around uh, retailers' uh, uh, approach to avoiding interchange fees. You know, so I, I think we'll see a lot more of that. And I, I think uh, I'll, I'll skip ahead even into the banking side. You know, we're, we're in a fairly... Um, m a centric world right now. And, um, you know, whether it's um, companies going into the public markets through SPACs and merging with a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company, um, or it's just the, the regular plain old vanilla m a you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, banks of variety of sizes that are continuing to expand couple of recent uh, big deals that have happened. I'm not going to mention names, but there, there have been a number of them out there. Um, and But you're also seeing different kinds of tie-ups. Um, there has been a trend over the last couple of years of credit unions buying small community banks to get some of the capability that uh, banks may have that the credit union doesn't have yet. I, I, I think we're, you know, we're starting to see some tie-ups between fintechs and, and banks as a way for a fintech to acquire a banking license. I think we're going to see more and more of this. And I think the reality is, especially in the U.S., where we still have well over 5,000 banks in this country, um, which is way down from where those numbers were uh, going back 5 or 10 or 20 years for sure, um, there is ample opportunity for a dramatic amount of, of additional consolidation. And what you offer, you know, it's a question of what, what, what's the persona of that new, uh, that new entity. It's a little, fintech, a little bit of a fintech. It's a little bit of a bank, a little bit of, a, you know, lending. It gets very blurred as to what the overall product offering is. And what we're also going to see at the same time, I think it's, it's very interesting to watch the, the goings on um, in China. And I think if you look at a lot of the major players in the, in the app world and in payments over there, uh, whether it's WeChat Pay, Alibaba, um, Ant Financial, you know, some of their apps today are super apps. Um, and, and what's meant by that, it's an app where you can do everything. You can do your banking, you can do your shopping, you know, you can, um, you know, do your payments, you can do your social media. It's almost like a mini internet unto itself with all these products and services, sometimes very disparate products and services. It's almost like a sh an internet shopping mall, all, all in one app. So I think we're going to see some of that. Uh, transformation happen at some point here as well. So is that is that transformation um, more on the retail banking side or exclusively on the retail banking side? And to what extent, if any, do you see that happening on the corporate banking side? It, it's a it's a great question, Craig. I I think the lines will continue to blur. And I think if you look, I, th I think where I am today at Synovus is an excellent example of this. Um, Synovus's history is in uh, community banking, and we're a community bank in five states in the southeast. But you know, we what, we're we're known for the, the the service and what we provide to our customers. And you know, interestingly, as much as everybody wants to go digital, people do still want someone to talk to where they can either go and talk to a banker in a branch or to actually get somebody on the phone. I mean, that's the frustration with a lot of fintechs. Go try to get technical support in most cases. Good luck to you. Um, uh, so you've got that aspect, but you know, certainly we're, we're, um, you know, we're upscaling 
the services that we provide into the middle market, the upper middle market, the corporate space, certain industry verticals. And I, I think if you look at uh, look at Goldman, who's your you know been your prototypical investment bank. You know they're now doing you know they're they're the power behind the Apple Card. Um, you know, um, Marcus is lending money. You can have uh, checking and savings accounts there. So, you know, while it, it may be under one roof and they, they can still manage, these institutions can serve a lot of different customer segments all at the same time. And I, I do think there's convergence. I think the corporate side does tend to run, uh, you know, a solid two to three to three to five years behind. So I, I think there's going to be catch up. Um, what's, what's very interesting, Craig, um, we're in the midst of rolling out um, a new customer portal um, for our, our commercial customers. And um, as, as part of that, there is a mobile component. And we're just finding that the, the mobile adoption is, is just so much greater than, than anticipated. There, there's just a desire to have these services in the palm of your hand. And it, it, it's, 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 I mean, even before COVID, I was starting to observe uh, treasurers um, and other treasury folks that, you know, would be going to their Apple Watch or would, would have an iPad in, in conference rooms to be able to approve wires, do approvals, be part of workflows. You know, that's it, it, just, it's, it's happening. It, it's out there, it's real, and that will continue to happen um, as, as some of us, um, uh, baby boomers, you know, I'm, I'm a last year baby boomer, I hate to admit it, um, you know, uh, kind of age out. Um, but as, as we become more driven and managed by millennials and below, um, I think there's just more and more comfort with the technology um, and, and doing all of these things in real time when I want to. You know, as you look at the, the segmentation from consumer to small business, to commercial, to large corporate, some of those segments blur, particularly on the, it, it seems to me that it, it blurs on the consumer to small business side. Certainly banks look at it that way. The expectation, the pricing models tend to, tend to flow that way. But as you move up, upstream in size and complexity, how, how do you see, let's say, capital, security, efficiency advice? I mean, one of the things about the larger you get, the more complex your structure is as a corporate treasurer. You're in more countries dealing with more types of payments. You have more trading partners. The processes can be a lot more complex than when I get into a, an Uber and travel somewhere and I've streamlined that process well. The challenges are, uh, the challenges due to complexity, other partner processes you know, tend to be more involved. Where do you see that break where we're talking about capital, security, um, advice, you know, the partnership, some of the partnership aspects, um, you know, will there be convergence there? Um, where will there be um, significant differences over time? It, it's a great it's a great question. And the question itself is is is, you know, on the surface, it sounds simple. Um, I, I think it's a very complex question, in all honesty. Part of it is, is meeting the, the customer, whether they're a consumer, a middle market company, uh, you know, a large corporation, meeting them where they need to be met. And you know, if, if you think about the constituents within a large corporation, you know, it, it, it still comes down to people. So there, there's going to be a degree of, of treating even large corporates as, as consumers. Because for a lot of the things that, you know, you, you, know you, you can't compare the interactions with a banker that go on at the treasurer level versus at a treasury analyst level. So I, I think a lot of the services and the day-to-day -day or minute-by-minute -minute needs can be met with a lot of the digital solutions, you know, real-time advice, real-time guidance. AI-infused capabilities that help with decision-making, troubleshooting, and the like. But at the end of the day, 
Um, I, I don't know that you're going to be structuring a deal with a treasurer, you know, for something, you know, in the capital markets or M&A or, you know, the, you know, the, the terms around a, a, you know, a lending or a, a revolving credit arrangement, you know, that's still going to require a, a, a personal touch, a, a banker, a relationship manager to interact. So I, I, I think it's really, it, it, it's, 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 it's having the right services and the right uh, capability and the right conversation, whether that's a digital conversation or whether that's a person-to-person -person conversation, um, you know, in place um, for depending on, on what the, 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 the actual need is. Yeah, I think that'll be interesting. And I'd, I'd love to ask you some more questions about what's the role of information and data and how that's going to change as you know, this explosion of data and how that's used and the, and the value of information versus, uh, you know, some of the traditional methods of, of banking and how that, how that intersects. But I, but I'll leave it there for that. And that's another um, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it's like the explosion of data managing and, you know, good, good advice, um, great data and insights, um, Value transfer, capital, security; those are those are massive, uh, massive items to consider. I appreciate your comments, but uh, Seth, you know, as we, you know, wind down the podcast, any any final thoughts? Um, I know I, I warned you that I'd ask you about final thoughts, but any any final thoughts you want to leave with the with me or the uh, the audience? I think it's a really exciting time to be in banking and treasury and payments. There's there is so much that's actually going on here. I think, particularly on the treasury side, um, and whether you know it's as a practitioner or even on the banking side, um, I think it's one of the the the, in, the financial world's best kept secrets that treasury is a really cool place to be, and you know the you, you generally don't learn about treasury in business school or in an MBA program, um, but you know and, and payments should certainly be multiple courses. Um, I, I did some guest lecturing on, on, on payments as well a few years ago, and that was a lot of fun. But I, I think for people that are earlier in their careers that are looking for something different, it, it's, it's a great space to entertain regardless of whether it's on the corporate side or the banking side. And, and along with that, I, I think I would, you know, we, we talk about the uh, continuous change, uh, the continuous uh, uh, activities that, that are related to all of this, the redesign mindset. I think you need to look at yourself from a redesign mindset and from a change mindset. Always be learning, always be thinking about what the next steps are in your career and um, how you can make that happen you know, to transform your current role into the next thing that you want to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we, 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 we should probably do a whole careers thing, too. Um, so I, we, we just, you know, we'll, we'll queue up a whole series of podcasts, Craig. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, you know, the whole redesign and the, the rethinking, uh, you talked about aging out, you know, you, but you also said 50s a new 40, 40s a new 30. Maybe there is no aging out. Thank you so much, Seth. Appreciate you uh, joining me in this uh this edition of the Treasury Update Podcast. Thanks. Great to be back with you again, Craig. Always enjoy it. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update Podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.